Welcome everybody back to the Latino Free Minds podcast. I'm Daniel. This is my co-host Danny. And we just want to say thank you to everyone that tuned into the first episode. We got a lot of good feedback. We saw a lot of good numbers. So we're, we really appreciate and, and we're thankful that you guys tuned in. And hopefully you're able to come on this journey with us and, and learn with us. And hopefully this starts a conversation in your home and it keeps moving forward. So with that being said, for this second episode and for the episodes that are coming up, we want to focus on some things that we touched on in the first episode. We touched on the tools that are used for manipulation. For example, schools, social media, politicians, celebrities, sports, and I believe uh, politicians. And politicians, yeah. All those tools are used to manipulate people. So on, on this episode and the ones coming up after this, we want to focus on several aspects of those tools. And for this one, we want to focus on schools and how the manipulation starts there at a young age to by the time the kids get out of school, you know, they've already gone through the system and they've been manipulated. So we kind of want to cover on how it happens at the school and kind of the things maybe we should be looking out for or as parents, you know, doing our part to avoid that manipulation from happening. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank everybody for the positive feedback that we got on the first episode and uh, look forward to this episode and many other episodes and continuing the learning together. So piggybacking off of, uh, you know, the, the, the school system, uh, we did a little bit of research into how the school system works. Um, we don't get taught how the school system works in school, so we have to do our own research in order to find out. And we wanted to break it down in the simplest terms that we possibly could for ourselves uh, and hopefully you uh, to get a better understanding of the how the school system works. So on the very top, you have the uh, State Board of Education. And right under that, you have the County Board of Education and then the superintendents. So what we really have to understand as parents is what the State Board of Equalization of Education does and who appoints the State Board of Education. So something that we didn't know is that the governor appoints the State Board of Education. The County Board of Education is elected by the people. Mm -hmm. The superintendents are also elected by the people. Mm -hmm. So when we understand how that system works with those different boards and the superintendent is that the visions of the governor are the ones that are being handed down and ultimately the curriculum is created off of, off mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So whatever the governor's vision is um, and his appointees is what's going to be handed down to our children in the schools. Yeah, and, and that's what makes who you vote for governor even much more important because now, again, we're focusing on, on the kids and, and their future. Correct. And one of the other things that we were doing uh, as far as research goes is in the last ele election that we had, we were voting for uh, board members uh, for the County Board of Education and the superintendent. And uh, we were doing some research on that because we didn't know who these people were. Right. And I th I believe you're the one that mentioned that it on the ballots, it doesn't show their political affiliation. Yeah, because it's, the... it's a school board position, so they should be nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. So they don't list, you know, what their party preference is, but obviously they have a preference and, but you don't see it on the ballot. Yeah. Right. And obviously we know that that's important. You know what their political views are uh, because that's where their values stem from. Um, so you had a great idea in looking into their social media because we were doing research online, you know, basically Googling who they were mm -hmm. and trying to get some information. And it's as if they didn't exist. So Daniel had a great idea to go into social media and see if he, you know, we would be able to find any information on them. And with today's technology, 
you know, <laughs> we do have to use it for our advantage. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it wasn't in our, it, it was in our advantage because we were able to find who was endorsing who. And, uh, and just with that, just with the endorsement, and you can, even though they don't tell you what party preference they have, it might tell you, oh, they're endorsed by the Republican party. They're endorsed mm -hmm. by the Democratic party. So right there, you know, for the most part where they're going to stand yeah. or, you know, if, or certain organizations endorse them. Again, he gives you an idea of which agenda they have or where they're going to go. Yes. And um, so what we ended up finding out was that these county board of education uh, candidates were actually nominated by the governor, Newsom. Uh, we live in California, so Newsom is our governor. Unfortunately. So, <laughs> yeah, true. And uh, yeah. come to find out that they were nominated by the governor. So even though we're electing them, they're being nominated by the governor. And we're giving a false sense of what we might be voting for. In other words, we're voting for, for people that are going to carry on uh, their vision. Mm -hmm. The governor's agenda. Exactly. And, um, that's one of the things that we, we have never looked into, but we should be looking into because these are the people educating our kids. And, um, well, I'll, I'll break down what their responsibilities are in, in this order. So the state board of education establishes the vision. Uh, they, they set the expectations. They evaluate the results and they implement and adopt policies. So basically what they're doing is they're, they're coming up with the agenda. They're coming up with the vision. Then they hand it down to the County Board of Education. And from there, uh, the County Board of Education takes that vision and uh, implements it into the different counties of the state. Then the superintendent comes in and they're basically the authority. They monitor the progress, develop plans on how to implement uh, that vision. And uh, again, that's why it's so important to know who, we're, who mm -hmm. we are voting for. Yeah, who we're selecting because, again, it's going to make a huge difference in, in the kids' lives, right? As far as their education, what they're going to be learn, learning and what they're going to be exposed to. Correct. And... You know, we have uh, different conversations out there. We talk to parents and uh, there some are of the opinion that, you know, we should let the teachers teach because they know what's best for the kids. But if we understand how the system works, we can understand that it's not the teachers coming up with these curriculums. Mm -hmm. You know, they're being handed a curriculum. So the teachers aren't just teaching what they believe is the correct thing to do. They're being told what to teach. Yeah, yeah. So we can't, you know, have that sense of... You can't blame all teachers. Well, you can't much. blame all teachers, but at the same time, we have to understand that uh, the teachers really don't know what's best to teach to the kids because they're not necessarily teaching what's best for the kids because they have to follow this curriculum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the the other side of the coin, too, is there are the teachers that grew up in the system and they're all for it. So, you know, we do have both. And some of the teachers that maybe, for example, aren't all about the curriculum or into it, they might not be able to speak up either because maybe they're going to be afraid of losing their job or, you know, any kind of complaints towards them. So it, it's a very, um, how would you put it, like a complex situation because in a sense, if a teacher wanted to fight back and the school board, the, the the state board of education and the governor are all against that one teacher, that teacher might feel insignificant and not even maybe try to fight against this. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing, too, is the that we have to point out is, to your point, it, it's a cycle because the teachers – we're educated in the same system. And uh, we had mentioned before that if if this system has been implemented to, since the 60s or 70s, we're talking about 
two to three generations that have been exposed, um, exposed to the system, right? Mm -hmm, they've, mm -hmm. they've been educated through the system. So now these teachers that were educated with the system believe with all of their heart that this is the correct curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, to, to teach. Yeah, yeah. So we have to break that cycle. And one of the things that we have to do in order to break that cycle is these positions where people are elected, for example, the County Board of Education, uh, they're elected, the superintendent is elected. Um, we have to have uh, parents and people that really care about the community and the children uh, attempt to get into those positions so that they can change the system. Yeah, and, and then, you know, these past couple of years, you know, with the pandemic and everything and all the other subjects that are, which we'll cover in some detail that, that are being added to the schools, you know, a lot of parents, I think in this last uh, midterm elections, we're running for uh, school board seats. And there's definitely been uh, more, uh, how could I put it, participation in that or, or parents trying to step up to make the change because, you know, the way the school system has been going, it's not beneficial to, to their kids at all. Yeah. And I, part of it, it too, is the conversations that you and I are starting to have is that we've always felt this way, but with everything that's happened in the past two years, there's a little bit of a sense of urgency behind it a lot more with parents mm -hmm. and community members. Yeah. Because I think, um, you know, a lot of parents really got to see that that the teachers, school boards, and so on, how they took advantage of their authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of what we were talking about was if it had a feeling where the parents' opinion or the parents' say didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that kind of leads us into this, is that since these people are elected by us, the citizens, they should be carrying out our vision they should, they, there are advocates, so they should be um, voicing our opinions in what they do and what, how they're implementing it into the education of our kids, but they aren't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you brought it up last time in a conversation is that they have like the sense of entitlement that, mm -hmm. you know, they're the ones that are supposed to, um, teach our kids what what their values are mm -hmm. because you know we're lesser than what they are they're the educated ones and uh they're that that's the vision that they're going to carry out yeah right? it, it's like uh i'm in the position you're not so i know what i got to do like yeah. that's that sense of entitlement where you know you don't know what you're talking about because you're not in my seat i'm yeah. here so you know i i did what I had to do to get here and I'm educated enough to make decisions because I'm here. So it, it's that sense of entitlement that, that really was noticeable a lot during these, uh, uh, another thing that again, the past few years happened was a lot of participation from parents in uh, the school board meetings, right? They were speaking up and you could see some of these school board, uh, members just not really putting any care into what the parent was saying. You know, there's a lot of passionate parents out there and, and these school members were looking at them like they didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. And th what we need to remind them is that we voted it in because there are advocates again and they should be um, teaching the kids what are our best interests as parents, which is just your basic educational uh, uh, topics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, a lot of politicians try to uh, manipulate us with or instill in us as a community is that they tell uh, parents that the kids be belong to the community. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we have to make clear is that our kids and us are part of a, of a community. We don't belong to the community. Mm -hmm. And what we have to understand is that our kids belong to the family, to our families. Mm -hmm. So if we can make a, a clear distinction 
that they do not belong to the community. They're part of a community and they belong to the family. It's our job as the family to instill the values um, to our kids rather than them instill the values into our kids. So what that means is just teach them mathematics, science, history, mm -hmm. those type of topics and leave like CRT and all these other um, topics and, and, and just take them off the curriculum and, mm -hmm. and let that, you know, be, to, be taken care of by the parents. Yeah. Yeah. And then just to kind of reiterate what you were saying about belonging to the community versus being part of, you know, that's a very important and key distinction uh, because if you belong to something, that means someone else controls you. Mm -hmm. And if you're a part of something, that means you have control. So it's a, it's a very key distinction to be a part of something or belong to something. And, and everybody should know that there's a huge difference there. And, and again, it's, it's, I think we were saying the other day is a choice of words, mm -hmm. right? And they have, they have both, both sentences might sound the same, but it's a whole different meaning. Well, it's, it's a strategy is that when a politician, so a figure, you know, that has, um, you know, a little bit of authority in their position, you know, politically, it, it, the words that they use in a way are manipulating us in a, uh, trying to make us think mm -hmm. that they are correct when they say, um, that our kids belong to the community. And, um, you know, when, when they do that and they have speeches or they have interviews and they use those type of words and there's a response like a thunderous, uh, response, like applauding, cheering, it, it makes it seem as if they're right when they say those type of things. Mm -hmm. But what we have to go back and understand is that, that, that is not correct. You know, they, mm -hmm. they do not belong to the community, but that's, that's one of the manipulation tactics that they use yeah, know, to, yeah. in order to make us believe that. And after uh, they make us believe it, we just give up those responsibilities mm -hmm. because they don't belong to us anymore. They belong to the community. Right. Right. And that's, you know, that's something that I'm pretty sure once we get the talk about politicians, but yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a choice of words and how they say it. And, you know, it's manipulative because then people think, oh, okay, yeah, this is good. And like you said, they hear, they hear that applause and, and that response. So it makes them even more, how could you say fortified in their stance because yeah. they think like, oh, they hear the applause. So I must be saying something right. Yeah. So, you know, definitely that's where we as parents have to stand up and say, no, what you're saying isn't right. Mm -hmm. Because even though it sounds good, I know how it's going to affect my child and their future. Yeah. And it's, you know, just the, the man manipulation is real. And mm -hmm. if, if we gauge a really good understanding of how the system works, we could really combat it. And one of the, the things that, you know, I have always said is this, is that, um, coming to the realization that we are the biggest influence in our kids' lives will fix a lot of these, uh, manip manipulation tactics. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they won't work on our kids if we're really involved with them on a daily basis mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of like the example, you, well, the example you gave in the first episode about, you know, your kids when they got home from school and how you would question them and make them think about, you know, what they've heard. You know, that's, that's a, that's a really important thing to make sure your kids are thinking critically versus just accepting what's being told to them. And, you know, when they're at school, that's, you know, they're young, kids are impressionable. You, you tell a kid something and you say, this is, this is what happened, or this is, this is what it is because, you know, the curriculum says it or the textbooks say it. And the kid thinks they're not supposed to question anything and just go, okay, well, yeah, the teacher must know what, you know, what the teacher's saying because the teacher's educated, right? It's an authority figure. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's, uh, 
I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> no, but it it kind of goes into the the Latino uh, angle growing up mm -hmm. is that if you're a first generation born here or even second generation born here and your parents uh, were born in Mexico and they didn't obviously go to school here, so they don't understand the system. All that they know is that their kid is going to school and they're being educated, right? So then the kid comes home and feels that they might feel like a little superiority type of complex, you know, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they are the ones being educated here in the system and their parents weren't. So then they come home and they start telling the parents what they were learning and in school. And again, it goes back to, you know, who appointed uh, these people and who elected and who endorsed the people that were elected. So they're passing that vision on to, you know, the kids and then the kids into the parents and then the parents, before they know it, they don't even know who, the, who their child is because, you know, they're being given and taught these um, curriculums that mm -hmm. have different values from what they have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely D different values. And, and, you know, it, it's one of those things why it's so important at a young age to be involved because if you're not involved, and you let your kids just go through the system and you never make any attempt to, you know, question what they're learning or, or in a sense, deprogram them. Mm -hmm. By the time they get to an older age, when they're able to think a little bit more freely on, you know, in a sense on their own, they're already thinking, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm learning because this is the way, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm educated. And then the parent wasn't born here or didn't go through this system that parent doesn't know kind of like you were saying right now. And and that causes a huge divide in the family. And then, you know, it, by the time you get to that point where you're able to have those sort of conversations with an older child, it might feel like it's too late. Yeah. Well, it definitely it would be too late because all those years um, have been lost and you're not going to gain them back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, you get to that point and it happens to be a little bit too late. The, the kids are going to go through their own life experiences and maybe they'll come back and realize that what they've been taught in school wasn't the reality. It wasn't mm -hmm. the correct way. It doesn't align with their values at the end of the day. But when people come to those type of realizations with life experience, it's right around their thirties. Yeah. So those are a lot of years lost, a lot of um, maybe broken families, broken mm -hmm. relationship wedges built into those relationships through, throughout so many years. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they want. They want us to be broken. They want um, the kids to uh, feel like they don't belong to the family, that they do belong to the community. And that's why they plant the seed early. Mm hmm. You know, yeah, and and that's one of those things where you just kind of piggybacking off of that. You know, a kid gets out of high school, they're seventeen, eighteen, and you said, like you said, they don't come to that realization most of the time until they're in their, let's say, early thirties. Mm -hmm. You know, that's about twelve years of helping advance because you know they're more than likely going to vote. Oh yeah, and they're going to make uh, just, I would say, uneducated decisions when it comes to voting because at that age range, you know, you're 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 easily manipulated because yeah. you've already been manipulated anyways. Yeah. So it's easier to vote for things that sound good, and it's just twelve years of allowing the system to advance because instead That's another of instead generation, of giving, yeah, they're already working on the other generation. So mm -hmm. when those people wake up, hey, guess what? The one right behind it is already bought into it too. Yeah. And yeah. they're following along with the same thing. And that's where we come in mm -hmm. is that by having these conversations, you know, w we put a stop to it. We identify it. We do something mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Uh, we go to the school boards. We become part of the school board, become more involved, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, accept that challenge of being the biggest influence in our kids' lives. And that's how we beat that. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we've been talking about is the uh, critical race theory that's uh, been going on and it's been a big issue. And I think that's why a lot of parents have gotten involved because mm -hmm. they don't agree with it. 
Yeah, and then and then that's one example because I mean, if you're thinking like, well, how 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 do they manipulate kids at school? Right, they're learning math, science, English. You know, what's what's wrong with that? Reading comprehension, and it's things like CRT, things like you know, early sex ed- education, and all that. That that's kind of what we're talking about, where they're yeah. throwing these unnecessary things at the kids that are affecting their ability to really learn, you know, topics that, you know, they, they should be focusing on in school. So that right there is an example. If you're wondering, you know, how, how do they get manipulated with math? How mm-hmm. do they, it, we're not talking about those yeah. subjects. We're talking about these other things that kind of get thrown in through, through the school board, through the governor and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the CRTs, a, a really sensitive subject because, you know, as Latinos, w- we experience every, I, actually, let me rephrase that is that any race that's considered a minority uh, goes through some sort of uh, racism uh, anywhere in the world, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to, you're going to experience that. Um, and without getting too deep in the weeds with that, the problem when it's being brought up in school is that in school, that should not be a subject that the kids get taught because if if there's any place where kids should be taught that they're equal, no matter, you know, race, gender, or whatever the case may be, is in school. So the teacher should be looking across the classroom and say, hey, all of you are equal. All of you can solve this problem. Mm-hmm. All of you can get the answers, you know, and all of you can write this essay and all of you can spell, read, and it doesn't matter what race you are. Mm-hmm. But what is the purpose of bringing it up over and over and over? And it's to create that separation, to create that animosity between, you know, kids mm-hmm. and yeah, and it, and it sets them up for for just kind of feeling less than, right? So if they don't, you know, know how to answer that question, they don't write the best essay or they fail a class, then they start to think, oh, well, it's because I'm, I'm Latino or mm-hmm. I'm Black or mm-hmm. it's because I'm minority, right? And it just gives them a built-in excuse that, yeah, they are who they are. They're not, there's no way to get away from, you know, who they are, but it just gives them an excuse to, to, if something goes wrong, they can just default to that. Yeah. And then they get this sense that they're owed something. Yeah. And um, so if, if something isn't fair, then, you know, they're owed something. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that aren't fair in this world and you have to work through them and you have to be smart about the choices that you make and the people that you associate yourself with and the positions that you put yourself in. So in that being brought up all the time, it, 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 it plants a seed in their mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, Latino um, families have as far as values goes is for the most part, is hard working, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, to earn your keep. Yeah, work work for what you have, and there's a sense of um, of pride in that, and that's what we believe that we should be instilling in, in our children. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, yeah, and and with this, uh, you know, kind of going to the critical race theory, making each other feel less than. And what you were saying, right, each each student in the classroom should be equal, right? Mm-hmm. They have equal opportunity. They can all, if they all apply their minds, they can, you know, learn well and, and pass the class, right? But there's a huge difference with also with equality of outcome, which is different than everybody having an equal chance at succeeding versus everyone has an equal chance of basically ending up in the same spot. Mm -hmm. So going into that, which you were talking about hard work is if everyone is guaranteed to pass the class, if you can't have uh, the the grading system anymore to not hurt a kid's feeling, right? If a kid is uh, disruptive in class, you can't kick them out of the class, send them to, you know, 
on campus suspension or whatever. In other words, discipline them. Discipline them. Yeah. What is the point of a student trying to advance if they know, well, at the end of the day, if I do all this hard work and this other student does, doesn't do any of the work, but we're both going to advance anyways, why do I got to put in all that effort? So it kills the drive of wanting the to work the work ethic of wanting to excel at something. Yeah. Yeah. And take pride in it. Yeah. And, and to expect that that's what it takes to get ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, no one gets ahead just by not putting any effort into it. There has to be effort into something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, completely different from, you know, what, we're talking about as far as education goes that that's planning a completely different type of seed in our children's minds is that I don't want anybody telling my kids that, um, you know, that they're owed something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Yeah. Cause, cause now, you, you know, again, kind of looking at it from a Latino angle, like you were saying before, if, if the parent didn't go through the system and now the kid's going through the system, um, what that kid for the most part, everybody wants to do better than their parents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if your parents didn't own a home, you your goal is okay. I'm a I'm gonna buy a home, and and so on. You kind of you set goals for yourself as a mm -hmm. child, kind of seeing your parents and kind of what they go through, right? You kind of learn that as well, yeah. and that's how we do also learn that that hard work is important because yeah, we as Latinos, that's what we believe in. We see all that hard work going on around us. And we know that, okay, if I want to have money and if I want to get a good car, if I want to get a good house, I had to work hard, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. like you said, earn your keep. But, you know, and, and as that first generation that's in the school system, uh, especially now, and with that being taken away from them, that hard work, that ethic to, to work hard and, and excel, you know, what the school system is doing is it's stopping them from doing better than their parents or, or excelling more because maybe their parents just came here from the, from another country and they didn't have that opportunity, but now they have it. And in a sense, the system is doing what it can to stop that child from excelling that family even more. Yeah. And that's true because, um, I'm 100% sure that in most cases, when someone does come to the United States from, you know, Mexico or any other country coming to the United States, that is what their goal is, is that they came so that their kids have a better opportunity and their kids' kids have a better opportunity and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. So with the system being set up the way that it is, it's killing that. And they don't even know that that's exactly what it's doing. It's killing mm -hmm. that plan, that goal that they had. And um, one of the things that I wanted to do is share a story of exactly that. Mm -hmm. So it, it has to do with uh, one of my neighbors. And um, with my neighbor, uh, we were cutting the grass. And I happen to know that my neighbor commutes uh, to go to work on a daily basis, almost two hours back and forth. And we were cutting the grass. And we started talking, we started having a conversation and he looked tired. And I know he's tired because of that long commute mm -hmm, early mm -hmm. in the morning. And I'm, when I say early in the morning, I'm talking about like three thirty four, you know, taking off to go to yeah, work. Yeah. So in, it was just genuine concern, if you will. And I told them, you know, you, you should get your son that happened to be right around 14 uh, years old to come and help you. You know, you work hard and you're tired and it'll be good for your son, you know, to come and help you uh, mow your lawn you know, mm -hmm. just to help you. And sure enough, it's almost as if, you know, before I could finish saying that sentence, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. My son, my kids, they're going to focus on school. And that's all they're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be well educated. Mm -hmm. And um, my response to him was, well, what's wrong with them being educated and having good work ethic at the same time? Uh, that's, that's the ultimate, mm -hmm. you know, goal that you would want is that they're yeah. educated and have that, uh, hard work ethic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if they end, 
if they end up doing well in school and they have that uh, hard work ethic, can you imagine what they can accomplish? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, they can and, do way more for sure. Exactly. And let's say, for example, that uh, they are smart and, and the school thing works out. Good. Fantastic, mm-hmm. right? But let's say that it doesn't happen to be their thing. At least they have that hardworking ethic mm-hmm. to fall back on and, you know, provide a living for them and their future families and whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But I, it, coming from the angle of a Latino, I kind of identified and I've seen it with family members. It's, the, it's like an overcorrection. It's like w- when you're driving in the freeway. Mm-hmm. And you hear the do, 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 because you you know you're starting, to fall, you're, you're starting <laughs> to fall asleep, and you jerk the steering wheel to overcorrect, and you, and it's actually more dangerous when you make that overcorrection. Mm-hmm. Is that's what I compare it to with what a lot of uh, Latino parents do, mm-hmm. is that because they grew up in an area where it was very difficult, it was a hard life, and they move over here. And they see that they can provide better for their family. They overcorrect by taking away some of those responsibilities that taught them the, the you know, yeah, that that hard work ethic or that just to kind of build that within them. Exactly, and at the same time, you know, that builds you know real character at the same time. Yeah, yeah it you does. know, and that overcorrection, what it ends up doing, it ends up taking that away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and the school system's doing it at the same time. And, and before you know it, you don't even recognize your kid in the way that, you know, what their values are at the mm-hmm. same time too. Mm-hmm. So we've got to be able to recognize that and stop making that overcorrection, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and, and continue to instill that into them. So, Hopefully they end up well-educated, not manipulated and, you know, uh, hard work ethic. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate thing that we can ask, you know, that, that we can accomplish for our kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then, like you said, if they don't get that work ethic at home, they're definitely not going to get it at school. Right. And, you know, if you're, if you're one of the parents that sends your kids to school and, and I think from the Latino angle, there, there are a lot of parents, right, that, like we've been saying, probably didn't go to school here, and they're sending their kids there. So kind of in, the, in the, the story you just gave, you know, if you want to send your kid to get educated and you, you believe that that's, you know, important, because it is, right, you want your kid to, to know things, um, you have to know what they know, in a sense, because then if you go all those years with without that balance, the, the you know, kind of like a check and balance, mm-hmm. then, yeah, you're not going to know who your kid is by the time your kid gets older and you're mm-hmm. you're able to kind of see hey, what's what's going on. You know, it, it's very it's very important. It goes back to being an influence. Right. Yeah. And talking with your kids and knowing, you know, talking to them about what what happened at school. And, and you might not get detailed answers, especially when they're younger, but always have that conversation with them. Don't rely fully on the education system because if that doesn't pan out and like, you know, kind of like the example you gave and you just bank on that, you know, w- what else? There is no plan B. No, the kid has nothing, you know, it would be almost an adult at that point yeah. has nothing to fall back on. And that's why it's very important because if you if you do what kind of what Danny was describing was if you have a kid that's educated and also has that hard work ethic, you're you're making independent kids. Oh yeah, and that's that's really important. Oh man, you're hitting uh, the nail on the head right there. Because uh, I'm gonna tell you guys another story. Uh, so <laughs> when when I was 18 is when I had my first uh, kid. I got started young, and when I was at work at that age, uh, already providing for a family, right? I wasn't fully awake at that time, but I did have a friend. I was 18 and he was 50 at work. I would, at the time I considered him my, my best friend. Uh, so it was a special relationship. I looked up to him. He was like, kind of like a mentor. And he came up to me when he found out that my daughter was born and he told me, you know, congratulations, you know, Mm -hmm. 
uh, and he meant it in a very genuine, um, sincere, sincere yeah. way. And uh, then he asked me a question and then he goes, well, do you know what your job is now? And, you know, I started telling them the, all the typical answers is, okay, be a good provider, a uh, good boyfriend, husband, all those type of things. And he goes, no. Mm -hmm. And so I, I asked him, well, well, tell me, because uh, obviously I'm not, I don't know mm -hmm. based on what you know, you're telling me. So he goes, the number one thing that you have to do is know your kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, he then explained why that was so important is because when he had his son and uh, he was raising them, he thought that he was doing the right thing by being the provider. And he was uh, being a provider. But at the same time, what he left out is that he wasn't involved in his son's life like that mm -hmm. to where he really knew him. So by the time he was like 16, 17, already basically an adult, he found himself uh, not knowing what his son's favorite color was, who, what his interests were, mm -hmm. hobbies, or mm -hmm. even friends or anything for that matter. Yeah. So just imagine if you're not a part and you're not a, the biggest influence in your kid's life. That's exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Someone else, something else is influencing him. Some, and, and, and you don't even know what it, the, their favorite color is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and if you, if you're listening to this and you really just think about that or imagine that, that your kid gets older and you don't know who your kid is, like that's, that's got to, yeah, I feel like that would hurt because. Yeah. You know, all of us as parents, I'm sure we all love our kids. And to kind of come to a realization that, wow, I don't know who this person is, and it's your child, that 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 sounds like something that can can really damage a family. Yeah. You know, and just you know, a person as a parent, right? Just oh, it I, it's something that I feel would be like, like devastating. A devastating devastating kind of is the perfect word yeah. for it, and. Um, and I really did focus on that uh, as a parent. And um, I was able to identify it at a certain point in our life is that uh, we we eventually bought a home and uh, the kids had their own room. And my daughter's room happened to be upstairs. And she got to an age where she was probably like 11 or 12. And all of her ha friends had TVs in their rooms. You know, they had their <laughs> own TV. And she wanted a TV, of course, you know, for herself. Yeah. And yeah. you said, you know what? We're, my wife and I decided that we were going to buy her a TV. So mm -hmm. we did. And mm -hmm. we put it up in her room. And uh, we both worked, my wife and I. And, uh, you know, I happened to get it home one time because my wife got home before I did. And I go, hey, where's our daughter? Oh, she's upstairs. And right then and there, I was like, oh, she's watching TV. She's watching TV, yeah. All right, when is she going to come? I started thinking, when is she going to come down and spend time? When are we going to spend time mm -hmm. together? Okay, so that way they went by. Guess what happened the following day? Same thing. Same thing. You know, where is she at? She's upstairs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, is she going to come down and eat dinner? Or, you know, you know, what mm -hmm. are we going to do? Uh, yeah, she would come down and eat dinner and then magically disappear. Up. Yeah somehow end up back in our room watching the TV. Mm. So after, I want to say about two weeks after that, that's where the divide starts happening. Yeah. And not yeah. to be a, con some people might take this as a controlling parent and mm -hmm, whatnot, mm -hmm. but this is how easy these distractions work. Mm -hmm. And that's just a word again, choice of words, right? If they want to label someone a controlling parent, like, no, it's not that I'm, they give it a negative uh, uh, meaning, meaning, mm -hmm. right? It's like, well, yeah, you're the parent. You should be controlling your child, what your child listens to, what your child watches, and what your child is exposed to. It's like, yeah, you should control them. But again, when when words are given different meanings to fit or to justify, mm -hmm. like you're saying, that division, then, yeah, most parents don't do it because – They've already been tricked to or manipulated to think, oh, I don't want to be a controlling parent. Well, that's the thing is that by you just saying what you said right now, anybody would go, oh, you do want to control your kids. Mm -hmm. 
and it, it's got that negative meaning to it. Yeah. And with the example that I just gave, my wife and I had control over, you know, us putting a TV in mm -hmm. our kid's room. Mm -hmm. So if you break it down to that, you know, to me, that's not a negative, you know, control. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's within our control to take away the TV mm -hmm. and, and, and keep the family unit together. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then this is what ended up happening. We took the TV out of the room and magically all of us were spending a lot more time um, together mm -hmm. after our work, after uh, her school, we were spending time together again. Mm -hmm. And it's just an example of take away that, that negative meaning. There are certain controls that are negative, mm -hmm. of course, you know, and anybody can spin it any, any way yeah, that yeah. they want. Yeah. But the reality is that there are things that we can control that are not negative. And then there are negative controlling uh, traits Mm -hmm. And that's not, we're not talking about those negative ones. We're talking about the ones where it can impact us in a negative way as a family. Mm -hmm. And that's how they break up the family. Yeah. And, and I think the the control we're referring to is most, it's mostly, if you want to use another word, the influence. Yes. You know, but that we've been talking about being the, the biggest influence in your kid's life, that control where you control what it is they're exposed to you know, good or bad. And as the parent, you should have and want that control because that means you're the one influencing your kid. Correct. Or you're allowing someone else to do it. So you're mm -hmm. allowing someone else to control your kid. Mm -hmm. So you, we can play it that way too. Yeah. Is that, do you want to give up that control and give it to someone else? Because someone else is going to take it. Yeah. And that someone else easily could be the teacher or someone in the classroom. That's because where are your kids most of the day in a classroom, in yeah. school. So if you don't take that control or that influence, then the, the place that your kids are at the most, somebody there is going to do it. Oh, perfect. How we started off the episode is that, you know, who's going to take that control? The state board of education. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the yeah. county board of education. Yeah. The superintendent. The superintendent. Yeah. And who uh, ultimately appoints these people and uh, and is on the top of uh, the hierarchy there is governor. the governor. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important to break it down to its root level, root cause, because it does affect us that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely does. And, and again, you know, they're going to, they're going to have their agenda in there. Oh yeah. And if you don't stand up as a parent or get involved or, you know, join the school board and all that, there or or speak up at a school board meeting that agenda is just gonna flow through with no resistance whatsoever whatsoever and and the the negative impact of that will be on your child will be on the future uh, of this country and again the cycle continues to repeat and to repeat until yeah. somebody puts their foot down and go you know enough is enough yeah and that somebody is us because we're the ones that elect them but going back to uh, the control thing, and it actually fits perfect um, with something that I had read from uh, John Taylor Gatto. So John Taylor Gatto was um, a very decorated teacher, award-winning uh, teacher. And um, he wrote about his experiences as a teacher and what made him so successful and things that he identified in the school system. And one of the things that he did is he compared it to um, – training fleas for a flea circus and just follow me on this because it, it sounds kind of weird. But <laughs> what he explained was that in order to train fleas, what they would do is they put them in a glass jar mm -hmm. and they would put a lid on it. Okay. So they're controlling the environment of the fleas mm -hmm. and they're controlling the outcome. How is that? Because when the the fleas jump and they hit the top of uh, the jar, they bounce down and they end up in the same spot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So after they do that hundreds, thousands of times, and they realize that they're not going anywhere, mm -hmm. guess what they do? They train themselves not to jump. 
they don't jump anymore. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So would you say that that's control? Yeah. Yeah. Right. To it's, it's a control to have a certain outcome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So this is what John Taylor Gatto said is that schools are like those fleas in that jar. And this is how, because they get put into the classrooms and they're given a set of rules. You don't speak until you're spoken to or you're, you're selected. And you, by the way, you raise your hand Mm -hmm. before you speak and you get, you know, the teacher picks you to speak Mm -hmm. and then you're being taught a a curriculum. And then the kid asks a question, Um, you know, the children's mind, um, the imagination is wild and, Mm -hmm. It, you know, it just comes up with so many different things. Yeah, they, if the one thing about a kid is they'll question everything. Oh, why? Yeah. Why? And why? That's a good thing, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. And and then what are they told? Because that's what the textbook says. Mm-hmm. That's w- because I said it. The teacher said it. Mm-hmm. And that's the way that it is. So guess what happens after a while is that the student doesn't question the teacher anymore. Mm-hmm. That imagination, that creativity is slowly taken away. Mm-hmm. And that's a form of control. Yeah. In a negative way. Yeah. It, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's the comparison that an award-winning uh, teacher mm-hmm. gave yeah. from his own experience. And the way that he was successful as he went around it, he asked um, the kids what they were interested in. And he, and he, arrange the curriculum to uh, work around what their interest was. And that's why the, the kids were so mm-hmm. successful and their grades got better mm. is because they were doing something that they were interested in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but and, uh, following the, the learning path at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good, you know, the analogy of the flea and then having the kid in the classroom is, is to me, that's, it makes a lot of sense yeah you know because yeah once a student's in that environment where you know you do as you're told and that's it kind of thing then yeah their their minds aren't gonna like you said they're not gonna be running wild they're not gonna be critically thinking about does this just make sense or does this not make sense well i doesn't make sense to me but i can't ask the teacher because she already said it's in the book so Mm -hmm. it's in the book you know, or, kid, and, what, is and what the do? book says is what it is. And that's yeah, it. There's yeah. no, squ- no question. Asked. So how, how does a kid question? You know? Well, and that's the thing is that they're building walls mm-hmm. and then they start confining them into walls. Mm-hmm. And we now know in reality and life experience is that there always isn't one answer. No. There's multiple answers mm-hmm. and ways of accomplishing something. And sometimes just because something has been done one way for a long period of time doesn't mean that it's right. Right. There could be a better way of doing it mm-hmm. if you're just creative enough, you know, yeah, innovative yeah. enough. Yeah. And then I think one of the things you had sent me was uh, the, the lady was talking about to. Uh, oh, that link. Yeah, that link. Yeah. The yeah. about when they take tests. Also. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That yeah. that you know a child thinks that when. They're conditioned to think that when they're going through something tough, they got to go on their own. You're at it alone. And and for a child, for a kid, you know, personally, I'm pretty sure you felt that way too when you're in school and you know you got a test coming up. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure and you know it's all on you, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you were paying attention and you know taking notes and doing what you're supposed to do, yeah, it was probably a little easier. But... You know, but it also gives you that sense of like, okay, well, I'm in it by myself. Yeah, but it, see, that's the thing. I think what the post was trying to say is that in real life, you're encouraged to work together, like in a work setting, mm-hmm. and solve a problem. But in school, you're in most alienated. cases, you're, yeah, you're, you're on your own. Mm-hmm. So why not do that? You know, in school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could, I could imagine that working way better in school. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the you, engagement, you, the engagement and, you know, they'd be learning from their peers. Right. As mm-hmm. far as like if there's a, a kid that, you know, is pretty bright and, and you're another kid there with them, you'll see like, oh, OK, yeah, this kid does this like this. And kids, I think, or at least 
for <laughs> for mine they're super competitive in everything oh yeah you know they don't they don't if they see a kid doing this well i want to do it too and i want to do it better mm-hmm. you know it's that drive of of just wanting to it's like natural i think and the kids just want to do things the best and well, be the that's best the thing. i think we're hitting on a really big point right here is because it's a natural instinct to mm-hmm. want to do that mm-hmm. right yeah, yeah and that's the whole point about the classroom setting is that it kills that drive mm-hmm. it kills that instinct yeah or at least it tries to yeah you know with the way that it's set up yeah and and again if if parents aren't involved then yeah it'll it'll accomplish if that's the goal it, it'll get accomplished well okay so let's talk about what you do have in your control and what you don't have in your control. Mm-hmm. So when they go to school, if, you know, state board of education and county board of education and the superintendent have an agenda that doesn't align with your agenda, with your vision, mm-hmm. with your morals and values, and the kid goes to school and you can't pull them out of school, you can school homeschool them or uh, do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that, you really don't have control over, right? Right. But what you do have control over is when they come home to you and mm-hmm. you get home from work, is you talk to your kids, you have that interaction with your mm-hmm. kids. That's what you do have control over. Yeah. And you that's put kind that of effort. what we're talking about mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. You put that effort into, you know, it's all tied together, right? We've been saying you put that effort into get to know your kid mm-hmm. and, and know what they're being exposed to. Yeah. And then, yeah, you have control over that. Versus, like, if you get home from work, kid gets home from school, and you kind of just drift off into your own little spaces. Wedges. That's the wedges just being put in between yeah. you and your family. And, you and without kids. sometimes, you know, without you even realizing or knowing that's exactly what is happening, next thing you know, again, because time flies, we know that, you know. Well, here's, <laughs> a, here's the thing. Okay, so we're talking about one method of manipulation right now school Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. school could be great but it's being as a tool um to manipulate uh that's our point of view and that's what we're talking about Mm -hmm. but to going back to that point is that we get home and we have we're going to be talking about all the other distractions oh yeah for sure but those are the distractions that drive the wedges so we Mm -hmm. come home instead of having that engaging conversation with our kids here comes a, a Thursday night uh, football, Monday night football, mm. or, you know, Sunday, you know, you dedicate your entire day to that, or, you know, the basketball, basketball game, team, yeah. or right now World Cup and stuff like that. And those are all wedges. I'm not saying that those things are bad, but rather than focusing on your kids, and if you are focusing on your kids, that's awesome. Mm. Um, but this conversation is for the the parents that, haven't identified that yeah and, yeah and that's existing in their life right now and those mm-hmm. wedges are being uh put in right now mm-hmm. that that's who we are speaking to right now yeah and i think i had said this in the last episode was like you know some some parents are are naive right or they're they're in, innocently they don't know what's going on because they're relying on the system in place to be doing a good job yeah. you know and it, and you know again each parent has to do their part, right? To make sure that that school, that system is doing its job yeah. and not just fully relying on it because from what we've seen with, you know, the the, the system and how it's gone with, with when it comes to school and the testing and in math, science and all that and scores just falling, you know, I think they're at the worst that they've been. Yeah, they're... You, you know that the system isn't working. In many ways. In many ways, yeah. They're focusing. You could say that they're focusing on the wrong thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. They're 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 letting all all the things that they should be teaching on math, science, English, mm-hmm. um, history. They're 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 not focusing on that. They yeah. want to push all these other things on them. Yeah, they're, like instead of focusing on critical race theory, why don't you give them a class on credit scores and how they work, how to buy your first home, how to get your first car. Mm-hmm. things that are going to prepare them for life after school because not everybody goes to college you know especially nowadays i don't think college is really needed in order to have a good career and and 
be successful. Yeah. You know, back then it was, yeah, it was something that it was more when you went to apply for a job, you would see it. Oh yeah. You need to have this degree or this, or this mm-hmm. now, you know, you, you apply jobs, you know, they'll say, Oh, it's preferred, but not necessary. Yeah. And again, it's, it's because people have their work. I think people are realizing that work ethic beats, you know, Paper the work. education the right education. now. That's yeah. a that's an the education awesome point right now. Right yeah. now is check this out. <laughs> so to Daniel's point right now is what he said, is that employers seem to be finding out mm-hmm. that these degrees that people have don't necessarily mean too much if they don't have that work ethic. Right. Because you just employ someone that has a nice piece of paper and they have a horrible work ethic, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And um, before we run out of time here, I want to share this uh, other uh, piece of advice that I got and from the same person is this, is that one of the jobs as a parent is to raise an independent daughter or son. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the way that it was explained to me is that you don't do that when they're 15, 16, 17 to be 18. That's not, that's not when you start teaching a young man or a young woman how to be an independent adult. Mm -hmm. You know, that starts early. That starts young. That starts as young as, you know, a toddler. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that, and I've shared this story with you before, is that if let's say, for example, I'll stick to that theme when I was doing yard work, right? Mm-hmm. And my daughter as a toddler comes up to me and I'm raking leaves and she wants to help. She wants to help dad. She wants to be a uh, part of what I'm doing. You know, mm-hmm. she wants to be involved. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I turn her away one time, two times, three times, four times after a while, she's going to stop asking because the answer is going to be no. That goes that training again, Mm -hmm. right? But if I say, okay, you know, and hand her, you know, a rake. And in my case, um, I didn't tell her no. I I let her as best as she could use the rake. Then I went to Toys R Us and bought her a toy rake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were raking leaves together. Together, yeah. And, you know, what I was actually cleaning up, she was actually making a little bit more of a mess. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But she felt that she was part of something. She was part, mm-hmm. she was involved. Mm-hmm. And and that's what, believe it or not, this is my opinion. Toddlers, they do that because they don't want to just be a pain, um, uh, a pain in the butt or a thorn on your side. Mm-hmm. They're doing that because they want to be involved. Mm-hmm. So back to the story is I got her the rake and um, I was making my nice pile of leaves and here she comes with her little plastic rake, mm-hmm. you know, helping dad. And she was making more of a mess. And one of my neighbors goes, hey, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're letting her make a mess. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, she's helping dad. You know, mm-hmm. at least, you know, that's what. what yeah, that's what in what her mind. Feels. That's, that's yeah. what she feels. Yeah. So, you know, she would uh, help dad and then, you know, walk away. And then I'd finish up what I was doing. But that's another point where we're we're being engaged and we're, we're developing um, children with these values at that same time. Mm -hmm. So as that was going on, you know, my daughter, by the time she was in high school, um, she got her uh, serving certificate, like food serving certificate. Mm -hmm. And she was already working when she was in high school. And I didn't have to say anything. I didn't push her to get a job in high school Mm -hmm. or anything like that. But that was already there with her. Yeah. yeah. You know, and she didn't complain about it. I mean, think about it. I know that there's a lot of kids out there that go off on their own and they're independent and they're um, they have that work ethic. They could also do it. I'm not saying she's one of a kind, but I'm saying is that. You know, she did that on her own mm-hmm. and in that job to raise an independent adult starts that early, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. It, it you know, I've, I've, I've seen it, right. I see how successful your, your kids are 
they're hard workers and yeah, it, it, it works. You know, I'm trying to do my minds are younger. So I'm kind of trying to duplicate that and make sure that my, my daughters, when they're older, you know, they're independent, they're able to work hard and, 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 you know, be able to, to, you know, take care of themselves, you know, yeah. and, and not just, you know, obviously financially, but mentally as well, yeah. you know, cause we don't want anybody to just come in and, and throw all these ideas that again, make no sense mm-hmm. in our values or in our home. And then, you know, if your kid is not prepared, they're not going to be able to combat that and be independent thinkers. So it, it's, it'll, it'll, like you said before, it'll just put more wedges, right? Yeah. And it'll just cause a greater and greater divide. But yeah, that, that what you're saying is, is if, if we have kids that are independent and grow up to be independent and to be independent thinkers that think for themselves, uh, hard workers, free minds, free minds, they're going to, they're going to excel, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to be able to, you know, you've always heard the same told to kids, right? You could be whatever you want to be. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're really going to be able to be whatever they want to be. Yeah. You know, cause, and then that saying, you know, that, now that I think about it is with the school system as it is and kids being told that in the school, it's like, it's not true. You know, you're, you're doing things that are holding kids back. You're taking away their imagination. You're taking away their work ethic. They're not going to be whatever they want to be. I think what you had said before was like, they just become consumers. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and you know, for as much as me personally, I would try to like justify any of that. I can't, I don't see anything good from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, you know, I think the the school system is definitely flawed. The, you know, going back to the governor, especially here in California, he's got his agenda. The superintendent, which lines up with the governor. <clears throat> well, got remember, the same agenda and all that. We watched the debate with him and um, he was trying to make his case, plead his case, just throwing out numbers of how much money he spent into the mm-hmm. the school system and just these other different programs issues, yeah. and all kinds of different issues, and they're just he's he's telling us how much money and how much money they're they're spending on it, but the reality is that with all the money that they're spending on it, the results aren't there. There's nothing to show for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have to do something about that as mm-hmm. citizens of the county, the state, um, the country. Mm -hmm. uh it's time and i think that's one of the things that we're having these conversations and what's very interesting is that it's we we live in a very interesting time because there's so many people that i feel that they've come to that realization too and they're Mm -hmm. all speaking up Mm -hmm. you know you and i getting together and talking about this um now is crazy because it lines up with all these other people that are actually speaking up right now. And they're actually being canceled as far as the celebrities. And we'll talk about that in another episode. But if if you think about it, there's a lot of people speaking up. Yeah. And I think here in this country, we've gotten to that point where there's a lot of people that are trying to unite us. And that's what we're trying to do mm-hmm. is by saying that we're Latinos. Uh, it's it, That's not to cause divide. That's no. not to cause it's unity. We're giving you the Latino uh, uh, angle mm-hmm. uh, experience that, that we've had mm-hmm. so that we can relate to everybody else. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of Latinos too that, probably feel the same way that we do and they just don't know you know they might know but they don't know anybody out there that kind of thinks like they do because you know going through the system and 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 just all that manipulation that's out there through all those avenues you know a lot of a lot of latino people also don't realize that you know everything that is going on with that manipulation 
So, you know, it is good that people are speaking up. It, you know, mm-hmm. we're trying to do our part. And like we said in the last episode is hopefully, you know, us doing this inspires somebody else to do something even better or, or use their voice or use their their time, run for school board or, or do whatever they can to to stop the cycle. Yeah. And a good way to put it is that, well, this is what would be inspiring to me is that even if it starts off a couple of conversations or a few conversations yeah, uh, for people, I would say that that would be a success mm-hmm. in what we're trying to do. And I know a lot of people feel like, well, they feel the way that we do. So I know we're not alone out there. Yeah, for sure. And um, the only thing that we can hope for is, you know, like a real change, not some, you know, BS change um, mm-hmm. that people talk about. You know, it's like real change. And, you know, just us become stronger. Don't let that uh, that word, you know, racism divide us anymore. Yeah. You know, uh, understand that no matter what race you are, it, if you have the correct mindset, you can accomplish what you need to accomplish, what you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And uh, no one can stop you. You know, it, it's uh, you use the word undeniable. Mm-hmm. We can be undeniable. If if we are if we approach things yeah, the correct way, if we, we want to be right, yeah. you make yourself undeniable to anybody. So when even when it doesn't work out for you, even if you don't get that position you were trying to get or that promotion you were trying to get, it's gonna happen. It's not the end. Just make yourself undeniable. So the next time it comes around, again, there's no way they're gonna deny you. Yeah, because you've put in that work, and it just. Anything that you consider a, a, a fallback is a learning experience, and yeah. hopefully you learn from it. So when that opportunity comes up again, you're you've done everything possible to to secure that. Yeah, one hundred percent. So I hope um, everybody enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I did. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And just you know, just to kind of summarize it is we want kids to to think for themselves 100 percent, and and parents to be um, right there next yeah. to them yep yeah and and like like we were saying we want change we want real change and if the next generation is constantly manipulated by the time they have the opportunity with their votes to make a change they won't because they won't know that their vote is that important to to break a cycle. Yeah. So if we start while they're young, and by the time they're you know become young adults, they're prepared for this world. Yeah. They're prepared for the realities of this world because it's better for a person to figure that out once they've gone out of high school and into the real world. Versus having to wait all the way till their thirties, like we said. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's one thing that you know. Again, to summarize this, we want kids to think for themselves, not be brainwashed, not expect any handouts, and you know, just build a good work ethic to earn their keep. Yeah, I think that's going to make them independent. And you know, what else could you want, right? And then at the end of the day, if you're involved, you're going to know your kid. Yeah, and what that's going to do is by you being involved, it's going to. Uh, tight family, Mm -hmm. successful children, and, uh, and your kids will pass it to the next generation. And, you know, hopefully it continues for many generations to come. And then, then our parents that came as, you know, as Latinos, um, Mexican Americans, the, the sacrifice that our parents, uh, made to come to the United States will actually come true. Yeah. Is that, their kids had a better opportunity. The kids' kids had a better opportunity, and they just start climbing up that ladder. Yeah, and that's that's the cycle we want. That's a, exactly that's <laughs> yeah. a, that's a good cycle. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this one, and like we said, we'll be back with uh, covering some of the other tools for manipulation, and you know, we'll get through these, and hopefully, we're able to spark someone's mind and. You know, we learn as as you guys learn. Yeah, learning together. That's it. We don't say that we know everything or anything for that matter. But if we learn together, that, um, that's a good thing. 
Yep, for sure. All right, everybody, take care. Thank you.